Okay, so hello everyone. I have, first of all, I apologize for the abrupt ending of the last class, which was around at the 32nd minute. Uh, somehow it stopped recording. So we'll continue from where we had left. The good thing was that we left at after finishing section 6.5. So we'll be beginning with section 6.6, .6, which is the torsion of elastic hollow circular shafts. So until now the shafts which we have considered were solid, okay. But there may be situations in which you have to pass say a fluid or a uh, gas or some electrical wires or some other sort of a thing um, through it and hence you have to have a hollow shaft. And in that particular case, uh, what would be the stress distribution and the things which we have just done before. Uh, in a case like this. Remember the difference is that a shaft is under twist. Okay, So there is no, uh, for a pure uh, twisting there would be no axial or bending sort of effects. So let's uh, see that. We examine the arguments which we used in developing 6.8 and 6.9. You already know 6.8 was a relationship between phi and mt. Let me just put it in green. Okay, 6.8 and 6.9. Okay, we'll come back. Okay, so we had used 6. Point, we had found 6.8 and 6.9 for a solid circular shaft, and we shall find the arguments apply with hole with equal validity to a circular shaft with a concentric hole. Okay, so we'll see that the same applies over here. The only difference is that we would have to subtract this uh, integral, the uh, polar moment uh, which we had found out. And we have, you have already done this in mechanics, I guess. When you have a hollow cylinder or a hollow part, you just subtract that part out of it. Because those are actually mass contributions or area contributions or volume contributions. So you can easily subtract that part out. Okay, so 6.8 and 6.9 will describe the behavior of a hollow circular shaft provided this IZ which you take. Okay, the polar moment of inertia which you take should be according to this figure. Okay, it should be pi R naught 4 by 2 divided by 1 minus r i 4 by r naught 4. So just like subtracting the full minus the hollow part. So this is contributing to the hollow part of it. And, or that can be written as pi d naught 4 by 32. 1 minus d i 4 d naught. Okay. So once you put this i z into over here you can get the relationship between the shear stress and the twisting moment or the twist phi with the twisting moment. So that makes it all uh, and it's a straightforward answer. You would still get this sort of a behavior. The only difference is that if you notice carefully, there is no shear stress in this part because there is no solid over there. So this begins only at the at this particular boundary over here. Okay, so that part is sort of uh, easy and compare that to this earlier case in which it had begun all the way from zero. Okay. 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 Now making a concentric hole in a shaft does not reduce the torsional stiffness in proportion to the amount of material removed. So it does not remove the torsional stiffness in proportion to the, I mean because the polar moment is not directly proportional over there. So an element of material near the center of the shaft has a low stress. Okay, we have learned this. And a small moment arm and does uh, contributes less to the twisting moment than an element near the outside because outside it is maximum. 
so more precisely the torsional stiffness 6.10 this 6.10 uh, for a given length of given material depends only on the polar moment of inertia iz you can see that and from 611 611 is this one 611 it is clear that the size of the hole enters only in the fourth power of the ratio okay so the size of the hole occurs in this fourth power of ratio i think you can see that carefully okay so r i by r o and d i by d o to the power of four okay so you should very well know how so when r i is smaller than r o which is the case this would imply that r i is uh, r i by r o is smaller than one so what happens when you take this number to the power of four it will become smaller still okay that's something which you should keep in mind this is a quantitative analysis which we are doing over here so and it would have certain implications of uh, on iz and if there are implications on iz that they would have implications on the shear stress and the twisting moment as well and the twist as well okay so the maximum shear stress 6.9 for a given twist and moment also depends in the same manner on the size of the hole to dramatize this behavior okay consider the two shafts shown in this figure over here 6.13 okay consider two shafts in signal which have the same cross sectional area but markedly different maximum stress and deformations so you have shaft 1 and shaft 2 and uh, it is apparent that the given amount of material is used most efficiently in torsion when it is formed into a hollow shaft so the total material used is same okay and uh, so if you have say tau theta max in this shaft that value would be equal to tau 1 and mt by 5 which is k1 is the torsional uh, stiffness okay that is for this particular shaft now for a hollow shaft okay you would have this as uh, what would you have so let's see you would have the maximum torsional uh, maximum shear stress as tau 2 and the torsional stiffness is k2 now let's see the uh, material which both of them are using it's the same material but they are arranged in a different way so let's calculate for the first case the area should be pi into 3 square equal to 9 pi units okay in the other case it should be let's see 2 into i'm guessing pi into 5 square minus pi into okay this should be actually by 2 okay so 9 pi by 4 so this would be 5 by 2 pi into 4 by 2 whole square so this would be what 16 25 minus 8 is how much 25 minus 16 is uh, 9 so this would be 9 pi by 4 units okay so the area is the same and hence the volume is the same so that is why I say that the total material which is used is the same in both these shafts okay so if you have given material you have made shaft 1 and then you have made shaft 2 okay now when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the i mean we have indicated the maximum shear stress and the torsional stiffness accordingly so if you want to look at the stress ratio when both shafts are twisted by the same twisting moment then 
if mt is essentially the same then you would have tau so i'm reusing equation 6.9 you would have tau 1 and maximum would be that the maximum value is uh, let's put mt into r is what 3 by 2 and then i z and in the other case you would have tau i z 1 i'm sorry and in the other case you would have mt into whatever well so maximum would again be 5 by 2 divided by i z 2 okay so you can find i z 1 and i z 2 using this and then you will find that the stress ratio is 0 0.37 tau 2 by tau 1 is 0 0.37 and the stiffness ratio is 4.56 so with this i mean you should do this calculation okay do this numerical calculation just to check also whether these numbers are correct now it is apparent that a given amount of material is used most efficiently in torsion when it is formed into a hollow shaft okay why do we say that because the maximum stress will be lesser if you make it as a hollow shaft tau 2 is over here okay so that's the reason you have so the, because if the maximum stress for the same amount of uh, twisting moment is uh, less then that would mean it has a lesser chance of failure so that's what you would do and then in the next case if you want the twisting uh, so when construction of a hollow shaft requires the extra labor of boring out a solid shaft of the correct outside diameter it is not worthwhile to make a hollow shaft except in applications where weight is critical so from a design perspective it is easier to say that well i mean you should make a hollow shaft because it is giving a higher stiffness and lower maximum stress okay but now you recall your course in uh, uh, workshop okay or some other course in production engineering this hollow shaft is produced by this process process called machining machining is a process in which you remove material so originally you will always have a solid shaft you will have to do this process called boring in which you remove in which you remove material out of it okay and uh, that is why they say that this manufacturing requires this extra labor of boring out a solid shaft of the correct size outside the diameter it is not worthwhile to make a hollow shaft except in applications where weight is critical okay so if if you have some critical situations only then you create these kind of things because of this extra effort there is also a limit on the increase in effectiveness that can be obtained by increasing the diameter and decreasing the wall thickness this is something which we will study in chapter 9 called buckling what will happen is i mean if you remove this material out these walls will be very thin okay and uh, you should be able to intuitively say that if you try to press it okay it is more likely to fail because of these thin walls so this will be a long shaft but thin walls thin walls shaft thin walls and it is hollow clearly so this is something called uh, buckling which we will briefly go through in uh, chapter 9 so we don't i mean this so this must be used very carefully despite knowing that a hollow shaft is a better way to go because of the reasons um, uh, which we have discussed so this should be done only in very critical cases because of these reasons the difficulty in manufacturing this all adds to the cost and the risk of buckling both of them okay so right now you can just see buckling as a, a mode of failure in which you have a thin long shaft like this and you try to i mean just what do you do is take a piece of paper roll it 
to form a hollow cylinder okay roll it to form a hollow cylinder keep it vertically on your desk and try to apply a force with your hand on the top you will see that it will be very very easy to crumple this and now compare that with another uh, solid cylinder of the same size you will find it hard to crumple so that is one way you can visualize buckling at this stage okay so coming to this topic of uh, stress analysis in uh, 6.7 which is stress analysis in torsion and combined uh, stresses it is sometimes of interest so now you want to have not just torsion so until now all our discussions were based only on torsion but now we want to consider some different cases as well so let's sort of zoom this in and take advantage of this okay so let's consider this case first so in it is sometimes of interest to determine the stress components related to axis other than uh, the r theta z set and uh, there are reasons where you would have to do that we'll see that a convenient way to determine these stress components is to use more circle for stress okay that's always the easiest method you want to you have the stresses in one coordinate system you want to move to another coordinate system just use more circle very easy to do that okay so right now if you see all of your stresses like tau theta z and strains are in the cylindrical coordinate system what if there is a need for you to move into some other coordinate system okay which is not cylindrical you will just use the more circle so figure 6.4 shows the stress components related to the theta z axis over here okay so you have this theta ang axis you have the z axis and the stresses are shown as tau theta z so this one is a tau theta z acting on the theta plane in the z direction okay so we will go with a two dimensional analysis because there is no stress in the r direction okay there is a, sorry you recall how many stresses are present in a twisting case there is only one which is tau theta z and definitely there is nothing in the r direction so when that is not there you can use one of those plane approximations like in the earlier case you had done that for sigma z not equal to 0 and you had found out this particular value okay so this figure is shown to you now let's see and this is what a more circle is over here i mean one of the so you have you you have this principal system in which you have sigma 1 and sigma 2 acting so this state of system can be converted to this and let's sort of come over here first so figure 6.15 shows the resulting more circle so in this one uh, the shear stress will be like tau theta z and uh, it's a reasonably simple uh, more circle because practically there is nothing else left out so sigma r sigma theta all of them are zero the principal values are zero sorry the normal stresses are zero so you have this only shear stress is present so from this more circle uh, we will see that the principal first thing you should know how to draw this more circle just by knowing tau theta z okay why the center of the circle should be on the origin first of all okay so that's something which you should know so you should go back to the discussions of more circle for a stress see that and then come back again unless you are able to draw this circle yourself 
okay so for this one the principal stresses are over here and over here which we would call as sigma 1 and sigma 2 and uh, the their magnitudes is the same as tau theta z which is the radius of this circle the orientation of this is clearly 90 degree and in 90 degree in the Mohr circle means it is originally shifted by 45 degrees okay so that is shown to you over here shifted by 45 degrees because in the Mohr circle you if it is shifted by theta degrees in Mohr circle you show it to be shifted by 2 theta so that's how you have 45 degrees and the directions of sigma 1 and sigma 2 are clearly shown sigma 1 is positive sigma 2 is negative so that's why you have these arrows okay in this way okay now in certain special cases the existence of the principal stresses components and their principal directions can be demonstrated directly for example if a piece of chalk and this is something which you should do unfortunately you uh, i mean you should have an access to chalk somewhere i'm assuming or something which is like a chalk which is brittle material with a low tensile strength and much larger strength in compression this is something which i have told you earlier that most of the brittle materials actually are very weak in the tensile direction but strong in compression that was also evident by the stress versus strain graph for the glass if you remember in chapter 5 so you should go back and check that the compression graph was going all the way up but the tension was not so high okay now if you have a chalk if you have a chalk and you hold it like a pen on one day from your left hand as uh, assuming you are a right handed person from your left hand please hold it on from the right hand try to twist it the chalk will fracture along a spiral line normal to the direction of maximum tension so if this is your chalk okay so this is your this is how you apply the twisting moment okay and if you hold it or you apply it on the other end it's the same thing because it has to okay now if you do this twisting the chalk will fracture along a spiral line normal to the direction of maximum tension okay so the chalk will fracture along a spiral line which is normal to the direction of maximum tension so the direction of maximum tension is this first of all we know it is tension because it's a positive sign we know it is maximum because the whole point of this more circle diagram is that you are able to find this maximum value okay so it's the direction of maximum tension over here now the chalk will fracture along a spiral normal to the direction of maximum tension so that direction will be this one which is perpendicular to the direction of maximum tension so you would observe that the chalk would fracture in a way like this i mean you will see that this is a spiral path and you see this line which i have just drawn is the same like over here this path i have indicated at an angle of perhaps 45 degrees to the axis at each point only thing is it's a spiral path okay it's not like a straight moon it won't let the chalk will not fracture and give you a plane like this no it will have these it will be like the surface if you look at a broken chalk it will be something like this so it will be 45 degrees all along that is what is meant by the uh, spiral path 
so it is easier to visualize this directly okay so please do this and if you somehow can't do it try to look for a video somewhere on the internet of the twisting of a chalk okay i think you should be able to find it that is the only i mean these things these little things which i tell you to do are the only things which will make you believe that what we study over here is not fiction okay it's so uh, it's a very real thing which lots of practical applications and unfortunately there are no other ways to use these theories in engineering problems this is the only way things like this can be learned and applied tomorrow okay so that's what uh, we uh, observe first and we can take another example as was mentioned in section 6.6 .6. A very thin balled hollow cylinder will buckle in the direction of maximum maximum compression. So if you piece of paper is rolled, okay, this is something you can definitely do. Roll a piece of paper and twist it. Okay. Roll a piece of paper, twist it. This will also be uh, evident that it will have this sort of a behavior in which in the along the direction of maximum compression is where the failure will happen so this is something which you can definitely see and you can easily see i mean the first line or the first crest which forms will be at this inclined angle of around 45 degrees okay and if you want to go all along i mean then it will be a spiral path which we have seen in the chalk okay a circular shaft is often subjected to longitudinal and bending deformations in addition to loading in addition to torsion okay so a circular shaft in any real engineering application it is often subjected to longitudinal deformations and bending other than torsion okay torsion is something which we have said and how do we know that i mean i think uh, over here look at this crankshaft it is experiencing torsion and bending okay look at this workpiece over here it is experiencing torsion and bending and there may be a case in which there is also an axial sort of a axial loading so you can have all three possible loadings in a shaft but by default shaft means ten uh, twisting definitely torsion must act the others may or may not be acting so in so this is what we refer to as this combined uh, stresses what would be the stresses under the action of all these uh, forces So let's consider this problem. The following example illustrates how the resultant state of stress is obtained by superposition of the individual. So we will superimpose these each of these states and then we will be able to find values. So let's see. So we have this uh, figure 616A. Let me just zoom into the figure first. 616A. A uniform homogeneous circular shaft is shown subjected simultaneously to an axial tensile force P and a twisting moment MT. Okay, so this is the first part in which you have the axial loading P and a twisting moment M MT. So we would want to find the stresses due to this combined loading. That's the first thing. So let's see how we can proceed with this. We have to consider an infinitely small element at any point of the shaft. Obviously we would want to be, it, uh, be away from the boundary and then analyze the force and stresses using the equilibrium equations. Finally, we would draw the Mohr circle to find the state of stress of the shaft material. So if you look at 6.16b, 
we have the individual stress distributions which are sketched do you recall that this is the stress distribution of tau theta z for a torsion this is the stress distribution for axial extension okay due to twisting moment we have a distribution of 6.9 b which is given analytically by tau theta z is equal to what m t r by i z okay and due to the tensile forces we show a uniform stress distribution over here okay so it this load p which is shown to act at the center is uh, assumed so again this is a small part of it i hope you can make that out okay this is not the whole shaft this is a small part of it and uh, so you will have this uniform loading because of this and that is shown in this figure a demonstration of the validity of this distribution can be given along the same lines used at the beginning of this chapter so just like we said that mt was not exactly acting and then uh, you would have a wrench which would actually act in a very different way but they are statically equivalent and that is how we are assuming this to be true now symmetry considerations lead to the postulate that plane cross sections remain plane but displace uniformly under tensile load so we have already done the symmetry arguments for tension uh, sorry for torsion and we found out that the plane surface will remain plane now what happens in the additional presence of a uh, axial load p the plane surface will remain plane for sure but they would displace normally meaning this might actually go up okay and hence a uniform distribution of axial stress will be there so in order to be in equilibrium with p the magnitude of the axial stress has to be sigma z is equal to p divided by the area okay and ro is the outer area of the shaft obviously there is only one uh, one radius ro is the outer radius now in figure 6.16 c these stresses are shown acting on a small element on the surface of the shaft so let's take this somewhere like this okay so you will have a shear stress which it will act at its maximum value now because it is acting at the surface so that's why you have mt r naught by i z okay and then this will be equal to p by uh, p divided by pi r naught square uh, because it's the same i mean so the shear stress over here is not the same as you move out and in but over here whatever part you would want to take it's uniformly distributed so it will still be this okay and the third one i mean you want to now combine these two stress effect this is called the principle of superposition the idea is that i mean if you know the elasticity problem uh, solution to this problem you know the elasticity solution to this problem then you will know the elasticity solution to this problem and they will all just add themselves up this is the principle of superposition there may be a formal definition somewhere but essentially this is meant so you can have a complicated so this is a complicated boundary condition for us right now okay right now until now we were not used to this so what was the easy way to break it down into smaller parts which we knew so we knew the answer to this we knew the answer to this so we broke it down and if there is a third one we can do the same for that and you would just add them up later on okay the individual stresses are shown uh, first shown separately and then superposed to represent the combined stresses now how do you do this combination the most convenient method of describing the combined stresses and it's not as straightforward to add both of them because one of them is in the cartesian system the other is in the cylindrical system if they were both in the same system you could have just directly added but you have to involve your more circle because you have problems in two separate systems okay 
this is in the cylindrical system this is in the xyz cartesian system okay uh, and you have to give an answer in one of them only so the most convenient method of describing the combined stress state is uh, to use the principal stress com components the more circle uh, diagram used to obtain principal stresses is sketched in 6.17a again by this stage you should know how to plot the more circle for this you have a normal stress sigma z you have you have no other normal stress that's the first thing and then you have a tau z which is over here so you are have you are able to draw this uh, circle so theta sigma so called the theta sigma uh, more circle and then you would find the principal values of uh, this that would be shown in uh, this figure so you will have a sigma 1 and sigma 2 and sigma 1 would be aligned uh, i mean the difference between the principal axis and this vertical axis 2 phi in the more circle so it will be phi in actual and once you have this uh, you will be able to so this stay so you are trying to plot it for this one okay note that this element is in a state of plane stress that is the third principal stress is zero so sigma 3 will be equal to zero and that is shown to you over here okay and sigma 2 is a negative value okay so this is how you are able to solve a problem of combined uh, stresses and you will perhaps be solving certain problems in which uh, all this will become uh, easier to see okay the last topic of this chapter would be the strain energy due to torsion okay so and strain energy was important if you remember i mean eventually we would want to use castigliano's theorem or an extension of it in some advanced problem if we do that and we have seen the strain energy concept being applied to many cases before this as well so in section 2.6 the concept of elastic energy was introduced is introduced and its application in the calculation of elastic deflections by the use of castigliano's theorem is demonstrated in section 5.8 which was a previous chapter you had a formula for the strain energy in a linear elastic material subject to an arbitrary distribution of stress and strain. So you remember you had all the components of stress, all the components of strain and you found out a formula for the strain energy density. Now you would want to find the strain energy due to torsion of a circular member in this particular section. So the only non, so the good part about torsion is there is only one non-vanishing stress and non-vanishing strain. So life becomes quite easy. You will, and they will be linearly related to each other. You can check how this tau theta z varies with gamma theta z. So the strain energy in this case will be straightforward. It will be half into V tau theta z gamma theta z dv. So the integration is over the volume of the shaft okay this is the volume v and uh, you would want to now use the hooke's law and then you can write gamma theta z is equal to tau theta z by g and uh, then you use equation 6.9 so 6.9 let's see what 6.9 was 6.9 was this tau theta z is equal to m t r by i z okay so once this is done you can write it as uh, sorry you want to substitute this in this one and then sorry 
okay so 6.9 is this and you find that u will be equal to half into v 1 by g m t r by i z whole square dv and this can be written as 1 by 2 l m t by g i z square d z a into r square d a so the integrations are over the length and the cross section area so there are two integrations involved over the length and the cross sectional area of the shaft since the latter integral is just a polar moment of inertia this one okay we can just write it as iz and then it would cancel out with one of these two iz's so this would be equal to m t square by 2 g i z d z okay so that's this is the strain energy due to torsion it is in terms of the twisting moment it is in terms of this material constant which is the uh, shear modulus and then uh, i z is the polar moment of inertia which is about the geometry of this okay so that's the sort of end of this particular uh, topic there is a small note which tells you that this derivation can also be done for uh, this formula may also be derived by considering each differential slice of thickness dz and uh, to act as a torsional spring so if the final so you can read this i mean and you can use this using the castigliano's theorem how will that work so we'll see that in a problem more importantly okay so this was example 6.4 you have a closely wound coil uh, spring of radius r loaded by a force p so you have this p the coil has a radius r okay and the spring consists of n terms of turns of wire so there are n turns of wire with radius r so this is the diameter 2r we wish to find the deflection of the spring and hence the spring constant so you want to find this delta that's what this problem is so you will see how using strain energy we'll be calling up castigliano's theorem right away so let's see how that works first we find the internal forces and moments acting on a section of the spring okay you will also be referred to problem 3.41 over here which you should have done by this stage if not then it, it is a time to do it right now before you move ahead okay from the free body diagram of 6.18 b we see that the twisting moment mt is independent of position on the spring and is equal to pr so this is the free body diagram of this we see that the twisting moment mt is independent of the position on the spring so wherever you take this this mt will be independent and then that value has to be equal to pr for the equilibrium to happen okay so and we have i think done this at some point before as well so mt will be equal to pr and the strain energy associated with this twisting moment would be u is equal to l p square sorry so mt if you see mt square is p square r square will be equal to pr by 2 g i z d z and that the total length will be equal to 0 2 pi n 
because there are n turns and p square r square 2 g i z r d theta so d z has been written as d theta okay and if you move ahead you should write it as p square r cube by 2 g i z 2 pi n okay so this length has been converted to the angle using the radial components and that's why the replacement of 0 to l from 0 to 2 pi n okay that's what gives you the strain energy for this spring now there is an additional strain energy in the spring due to the transverse shear force okay uh, but that we are able to ignore due to a problem 7.27 so you will perhaps do that later on but the point is that you are not considering the transfer shear force right now because it will be shown to be negligible don't assume anything to be negligible right on your own okay you must actually do it and see whether it is actually negligible so problem 7.27 as is noted in your book will be dealing with that so very likely we'll be doing that problem and if we somehow miss you should do that yourself so we neglect the contribution of the transverse force and consider a to represent the total strain energy in spring so this should be a is the total strain energy in the spring now we just want to use the castigliano theorem so delta would be equal to do u by do p okay So that's why that's where you can you find the deflection and once you have the delta using this caustic Lyra's theorem you can find the spring constant that would be P by delta and that's where you can find the spring constant. So you have seen that the caustic Lyra's theorem has provided a simple means of evaluating an elastic deflection in a system of geomet geometric complexity. So that is where this uh, we leave it out over here and uh, this is also so called the end of this uh, chapter 6 and we will now be later on considering uh, chapter 7 which is about the diff uh, stresses due to bending. Okay. So if you have a beam which is bending what are the stresses in there. So we will consider that in the next chapter. Thank you.